Um, I'm sort of going to talk about this, but really what I'm going to talk about, uh, according to Dr. Uh, Scott at the Fayetteville, there's about 300,000 water bodies in Arkansas. We tend to think of the lakes and the rivers and that kind of stuff, but um, one thing I want to mention is there are over 100,000 farm ponds, and these are, are generally managed by private individuals, so that's what we spend a lot of time on. People may want to uh, manage it for the fisheries, as Dr. Lockman talked about, but other people just want to have it to make their house look nice, or maybe they want to have it for wildlife or other reasons, multi-purpose. A lot of people, it's just a uh, stock watering. So some of the common prop, pond problems that we see, I'm going to cover, I'm just going to mention, I'm just going to touch on them briefly. There are things that you can uh, work with through your county extension office, and they can bring us in as needed. Uh, low oxygen is, a, is real common, these pond turnovers that lead to fish kills. People generally think that their, their fish were poisoned, but it's typically an oxygen problem. Low minerals, aquatic plants, excess nutrients. And the other thing that's not really related, but I do want to mention is some of the work that the center does on conservation culture for these species. It's really kind of neat, and I just wanted to bring that in. Low oxygen, typically people see dead fish. We're coming up on the season. Through the spring, ponds seem to do fine. Then we hit a series of hot and still days in typically May into June. It's very hot. It's still. Um, we get a development of stratification in the pond. The upper layer has the oxygen. The lower layer, because of the things, the leaves and everything, the winter start decaying, it generally goes without oxygen. If you step into a farm pond, you know, Top layer is hot, but it's cool down where your toes are. This is what's happened. And then we get these fronts coming through here in Arkansas. And you get you know, these storms sweep across in May. And generally what happens with that then is we get a mixing of these layers. And there's not much oxygen in that water. And so what happens is generally people come out in the morning and they find dead fish laying around. It's particularly bad at night because there's no photosynthesis, no oxygen being produced. And so people come out and they see white bellies and they give us a call, uh, which is usually too late. Now on our research station, we use little aerators and we manage to keep the oxygen up at night and so on. And this would be the, the best, obviously, is to do that until the pond comes around. Usually these farm ponds, in a couple of days they come around and they come back and then the, the fish are okay. In farm ponds, obviously, most people don't have aerators like these. The point is, if you see your fish up around the edge, especially after one of these storm fronts comes through, then having some sort of a pump or something, a boat motor in a stationary place, somewhere to put some water into the air or air into the water to try and uh, create a refuge for the fish, it's pretty difficult to do. Some people will put bush hogs in, and that's what I'm <laughs> It's a good way to tear it up. And if you have a well, that's not going to probably help you much because most well water doesn't have oxygen. Um, low hardness and low alkalinity. If you're in the, the Gulf Coastal Plain where you have a lot of pine trees on your farm, the area south of us, Rise and Fordyce and so on, we tend to see cases of, of low minerals, fish living basically in the still water. And this is, we just sort of pass through the season, but we can do the water testing at UAPB, but we do the simple alkalinity and hardness for free. It's a simple test. If one that get more complicated and send it off to Fayetteville, that'll cost you $100. But Emily in the disease lab, and, uh, count, a certain number of county agents have kits that we've given them that will be able to do this. It just takes a minute. Generally, you see this it's in late uh, winter, early spring. It's uh, areas with the acid soils. If farmers have to lime, this is where it happens. It's variety of different kinds of fish, a few at a time, so it's a chronic loss. And then it's, you just often see those sores. And we see that uh, water is really clear or, or tea colored. Sometimes it's muddy. And often it's where you have pine trees on, on the watershed. And you're seeing where the farmers are recommended to lime. That's typically where we see this stuff. And basically what it is is you have a lot of rainwater washing through those ponds. And the fish are living in, in waters that are very low in hardness and alkalinity. And it's just a stressful for them. So the way they do the, the, the cure for that is to test the water for the alkalinity. Um, if it's needed, then you do a soil test to find out how much egg line, and then it's something that may have to be done every couple of years. Um, most people that have ponds eventually end up with weed problems. This is a, a farm pond near Pine Bluff, and it's been taken over by an invasive uh, 
uh, alligator weed. And, and you can see the pond is really quite shallow, and that's usually what happens. If you look at the, well, this is, I know this isn't much of a drawing, but new ponds generally for the first five years or so don't have much in the way of weed problems. We had a student, Patty Eklund, did a farm pond survey and looked at weed problems, and generally people whose pond was less than five years old weren't <coughs> reporting any weed problems. But what happens, of course, with time is you add the nutrients, you have the banks, uh, Sediments washing in, the banks get trampled down by livestock, and you end up with a pond full of weeds. And this is generally what we get to call. And of course, you know, people being people, they want the magic trick to, you know, come get rid of the weeds for us. <laughs> and you know, if the problem is the conditions that led to those weeds being there, even if you were to get rid of them, are going to result in those weeds coming back. And so, with, especially with older ponds, you have to. Um, look at sort of an integrated approach to trying to get rid of them. There's different kinds of weed problems. There's the, starting at the upper left, uh, there's the floating kind like duckweed, and we move on to the submerged ones like the southern Mayan. You see a lot of water primrose, it's an emergent one, it grows out from the bank, has those yellow flowers. We're seeing more and more of this. And then there's sort of the filamentous algae moss kind of things that are out there in the pond. Of course, you know, not all plants are bad. You know, the definition of weed is just a plant out of a place. Um, there are some that are beneficial for wildlife, but there are others like that primrose and the alligator weed that really take over a pond. You have a little bit going, a little bit is too much, because before you know it, it's going to be a lot of it. Aquatic uh, chemicals, that, chemicals that have an aquatic label are really expensive. I don't know how to tell you that, but they're much more expensive than what they use on row crops or anything else. The, the clearance process to get those things is really expensive. So you want to avoid using chemicals simply because of the cost. Those are some beneficial plants that you tend to see that are good for wildlife. Um, so not all plants are bad. It's, it's just some of them will, will get out of control. They, the easiest thing is if you have a pond, if your edges are fairly deep, if it drops off to about two and a half feet, if you like to fish and want to maintain a fertile pond, that fertility will shade the bottom and keep a lot of these rooted plants from coming up. We recommend with a game of fish of stocking three to five grass carp an acre as a preventative measure. Uh, they won't eat the things that come out of the water. They have trouble eating the, the floating stuff, but they'll eat the soft succulent stuff in the pond that, that can take over a pond. Uh, if you're going to consider chemical control, we're sent you to the county extension office, and especially MP44 is recommended chemicals for weed and brush control, because some new chemicals coming along, and, and uh, it's good to consult with that. Another way is simply trying to reduce the nutrient loading, especially if you're not going to do a fishery. So if you're not interested in fishing, reducing nutrients is good. If you're interested in the fishing, you want to have a certain level of nutrients in there. The one thing I will say on, on chemical control is you need to have proper ID. And this is where the county extension office, and if they don't know, they'll send us pictures, and if we don't know, we'll send it on to somebody else. But proper ID is critical to getting the best chemical that'll work on that particular weed. Because some that look alike, it, although it, the chemical won't work at all on that particular weed. So it's important to get some help on this. Go to your county extension office, and then they can get in touch with us as needed. I mentioned for fishing, if you're going to have a fertile pond, you're not going to feed. Having some color in your pond, as long as you don't mind it, is actually good. It forms the base of the food chain. It actually produces more fish, better fish. A fertile pond can produce three to four times as many fish as one that's infertile. So fertility is good in some cases. Now you can't have too much. And we do get calls from people that are not interested in the fishery, but they have a pond that's covered over with weeds or algae and it just becomes too dense. And typically, they're livestock ponds, but also ducks and geese can contribute. We've seen ponds that are just getting loaded up with the nutrients from, from those. Typically, it's something on the watershed. Somebody will put out poultry litter, and they put it out right close to the pond as well. Or they have a heavy rain, and right after they put it out, it'll wash that. And it doesn't take much phosphorus, just a small fraction of it, to hit that pond to get you an algae bloom septic systems and so on. And you start seeing things like these surface films uh, that form on there. 
filamentous algae is a big problem. You've seen lots of this. This is on our own station, so we're not immune to these problems. Uh, duckweed is real common. It's a little uh, plant that floats. You can see the border and the size of little root hairs on it. There's another one that's often mixed with it. It's called water meal. Actually, it feels like cornmeal when you rub it between your fingers. Dr. Goodwin took this picture for me. It's, these are tiny leaves. If you look at that, that's a nickel. It's like one of the smallest little plants. There are no roots on that thing. So it's just a little leaf by itself. But this thing can cover a whole pond. When it covers the pond surface like that, it'll suffocate the fish. Now we get people that want to have a clear, absolute clear pond, and they want to have the really big fish. And that just doesn't happen. You need that fertility in order to have the big fish. So what you're going to do is, you know, mix in nitrogen, especially phosphorus, and sunlight and warmer temperatures once it gets about 60, 65 or so, and you're going to get that green pond. And if you're looking for a fishery, this is what you want. You want to have a nice green pond as long as everybody's okay with it. Now, sometimes you don't want to have those nutrients getting into your pond. You want to reduce the, the amount of nitrogen and phosphorus that are making it into your pond. And one of the ways to do that is by leaving an undisturbed, grassy vegetation strip next to your pond around the watershed. They've done studies in that area right close to your pond is actually where a lot of the nutrients come into the pond. It's not sort of what's higher on the watershed, but really close to your pond is where a lot of that comes in. And being able to track those nutrients before they enter your pond helps to keep it clear. If you're running livestock on it, it's also important not to have them loafing around your pond. But if you're going to have them either try and water it below the pond, which few people do, or restrict their access to a couple of locations so that they're not loafing and, and doing their business in your pond. Uh, here's a picture from uh, England, and you've got a nice strip there, the vegetation. They've got the place for the cattle to come, but they water in just one or two locations so they're not tearing up the whole bank. So prevention, if you're not interested in the fisheries and you want that clear water, so you add nutrients if you're looking for good fish. <laughs> you keep them out of your pond if you want nice clear water. And again, leaving that buffer, that buffer strip of grassy vegetation around your pond and avoid adding nutrients to it will help keep your pond from, from having a lot of weeds and a lot of uh, green color to it. Now, if you have a pond that has been really full of nutrients, it may often take a while to clear out because you get the nutrients are really essentially recycled within the pond. So it won't clear um, immediately. We do have a little fact sheet on some of these uh, scums and so on that talks about buffer strips if you're interested. I did want to mention the conservation culture efforts. So this is of the center, Dr. Steve Lockman and Dr. Peter Parsh, Walker, Peter, uh, yeah, are the ones that are actually doing this work. So uh, Now, some people don't like gator gar. There are certain locations where they are an important element to the aquatic ecosystem or where you need that top predator in there to control rough fish and so on. Game fish is trying to conserve the populations, but they think they may have to do some stocking at some point. And so that Dr. Lachman and Dr. Pershbacher are looking at culture methods and cost-effective culture methods for alligator gar. Dr. Lachman is doing the indoor from the fry to uh, three-inch fingerling or so, and then Dr. Pershbacher is taking them and, and raising them up to a larger size. They're looking at different feed types for the uh, gar, how to feed them. They've got really interesting habits. And Dr. Pershbacher's done some pool and pond studies to get them up to a larger size. The last thing I want to mention is Dr. Steve Lachman is working in yellow cheek darter, which are endemic to Arkansas. They're restricted to a watershed up in north central Arkansas. They're candidates for the threatened list. The numbers have been decreasing. The habitat is shrinking. They're ways, looking at ways essentially of, of uh, spawning them indoors, uh, getting young to restock. And they've done a number of studies. I've just condensed the number of staff and students he's had involved in these projects with funding from both Fish and Wildlife and the, and the center. And with that, our end. Do you have any questions? Our There's a number of the grubs, and they tend to be linked to they have a life cycle that goes through snails. You get a lot of vegetation, you have snails on them. There's a, there's a life cycle for these grubs that goes from a bird to the snail to the fish. Right away. And uh, so if you have um, 
grass carp in there to help to remove vegetation. And if you have shell cracker or red or sunfish in there to help take care of some of the snails, you can reduce the incidence of those grubs. But otherwise, something you see it in the river, there'd be fish coming in when they had the grubs in there. And it's that it, you can't do anything about the birds, federally protected. So you have to focus on getting rid of the snails. And to get rid of the snails, you almost have to get rid of the vegetation. So the combination of grass carp and then having some ready in there, ready or sunfish is going to help well, that. Well, the same as if it came out real. Oh, yeah. okay. <laughs> well, but I was just wondering about them getting in the pond, what would you do about it? Uh, you just try and keep them from going through that life cycle by not having snails in there. Yeah. I have a pond and it's about half an hundred or so and all we catch is little tiny fish, little sunfish, little crappie, little whatever. It's out of balance. Yeah. Can I start over? Can I you can, you can you can uh, completely poison it out with rotenone. We often suggest people get with their local game and fish biologist if you're gonna rotenone it because often they have a they can get you a source of rotenone at cost. They use most of it poisoning out the snakehead. I think most of the world's supply went to the Asian carp <laughs> and the snakehead. But um, just in case, because you don't want any getting in any streams downstream here, you know. And so having them involved is always a good way to. Well, he told she told me to do that. <laughs> Have them involved, but they, you can poison it out and then restock if that's the case. Um, the other option might be to if it's if you don't have any bass in there, and maybe that you're lacking bass. And you can look at that MP360 uh, and, and look in there and kind of, um, we're coming up on, typically in May where you do a balance check, you can either from the, there's, there's some charts in there based on what you're catching and also on what's reproducing. If you, if you don't have bass reproducing in there, you're gonna end up with a lot of stunted fish. Now, half an acre, it's, it's very hard to have a balanced population in that anyway. But typically, they recommend on the small ponds, you're better off with catfish only. It's really hard to get the, the prey and the predator balance going in small half acre ponds. Again, the fish have a stocking program for ponds? They quit doing the pond stocking to the. the um, now we have a, actually have a sport fish supplier list for people who want to buy fingerlings. Uh, you have to buy them from the private farms, but there are a number of farms, especially in Lone Oak and so on, that will provide those fish at a cost. They quit, yeah, they quit doing that. No, the zebra mussels probably in the Arkansas River to stay unless we have a global warming enough to, to warm up those temperatures. But I think the temperatures are such where the population doesn't really build real high and then blue cats have learned to eat them. So there, there are things that will feed on them. I'm more worried about things coming down from the Great Lakes and what else comes down from there. Round gobies and other things. I'm not sure how far. Your uh, rough. So. All right. Uh, I just wanted to mention that uh, I work for Audubon, and um, we had some success on Fish Creek with uh, killing alligator weed by just laying a big flat plastic tarp over it mm -hmm. when it's really hot in yeah. the summer, and then the sun, you know, and heat kills the alligator weed. So that's a real, you know, chemical-free way to... That'd be great if you had a small part come in, if you could get to it fast. We looked at that. Right, yeah, I mean, you could prevent, yeah. prevent it from spreading. The, um, there is a biological control, that. the alligator flea, flea beetle, but we're at the range where the alligator weed thrives, but the beetle doesn't make it through yeah, the Yeah, we, we, so we tried to use that, too, and it's not, it had, nothing's really worked except yeah. just laying this black plastic over no. the weed and killing it. That makes a lot of sense. If you can get to those weeds early that you don't want like that, that's really important. Okay, thank you.